Okay. I'm just letting everybody in because we are recording live today, which is so exciting. Welcome to another episode of Sparkle on Substack with me, Claire Venus. As you all know, I am an engagement consultant and mentor, and I'm so <laughs> geeky about depth of connection. So I'm delighted that I've got my pal and colleague, Lindsay, here today. And we're going to delve into the topic of audio and using audio on Substack. So if you're here live, welcome. Yay. This is a podcast that will be recorded and used in the future. People will find it whenever they find it, which was so lush. If you want to turn your cameras off, you're so welcome. I am recording it for my members and Lindsay's recording it for hers. And that usually goes up on YouTube as well. So if you just want to be cameras off, you can. If you're ready to just share your lovely smiling face with the big wide world, that's cool too. So whatever you'd like. And we're going to leave time for questions at the end so do hang out if you have to go pop it in the chat and I'll ask Lindsay it and then obviously we can get round to it so if you want to stay live and chat um you can do that if you want to put a question in the chat and for me to read it out then that's cool too so I think that's all the housekeeping welcome Lindsay can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do in the world Oh yeah, thanks Claire. I'm just delighted to be here. It's a glorious day in Glasgow. I'm just going to start with that. It's so lovely outside and I was working on my Substack post for Sunday. I've unmuted myself. There we go. Can you hear me? It's all good. I was in the garden um, working on my Substack post for Sunday. So we're recording this on Friday afternoon um, and yeah, so I am a writer, my life writer primarily, um, based in Glasgow, and I write books. I'm in the middle of a proposal for another non-fiction, narrative non-fiction book. I've got a novel on the go and um, a memoir that is finished, and we're going to speak a lot about that today. Um, and I also write on Substack, as you know, it's the place that I um, have gone all in with all the different strands of my work. So I host my um, express writing courses and journaling courses and sessions through Substack and also it's the place where I um, appear every Sunday in people's inboxes mostly for free um, with sort of perimenopausal, post-therapy, midlife, parenting, grief, um, sort of words on all of that stuff sometimes um, on caring and I have conversations over um sort of caring responsibilities and creativity uh, with people who are also experiencing that as part of their life, whether it's a parent or whether it's their own little people that they have a caring responsibility for. Um, and a bit about just that reader and writer kind of life. So I love to bring people into those sorts of conversations as well. So that would be Sundays. And on Wednesdays, I launch a new episode of my memoir, is called Held in Mind, which is all about maternal intergenerational trauma, breaking free from the cycle. Um, and that comes out, yeah, every Wednesday at the moment behind the paywall for my members. So that's me. That's everything I can say at this moment. As we... so, it's such beautiful work and such a lot of work, Lindsay. I think we will acknowledge that there's a lot of work that you're doing on Substack and you work outside of Substack as well. Obviously, you write in your books. There's a lot going on. But Substack, I think, for you is your online home, isn't it? It's like that's the place people can read your work, listen to these episodes of your memoir, which are just fascinating, read so beautifully. Um, and then you obviously have other places that you plug in online, but it's pretty much about Substack, isn't it? It's like, this is the place, this is where I'm holding space for all of it. Do you see it as like a digital magazine, a hub uh, for members? Like, what? how do you see it? Because obviously we can do so much creatively with Substack. I'd love your take on that. Well, it's evolved. So I would say initially, when I first started publishing, sort of about 18 months ago, I set up my account and um, took a while to decide what I was going to do with it. But it was very much like, a kind of um, instead of a website. So what could I create online for my writing that would give, um, at the time, potential editors, publishers, because I had an agent, but would give them somewhere to go to visit to see a breadth of my work. And I had a website, but it was like, what, what can you put on a website? And I have work that goes elsewhere um, but it, it all feels like it just disappears out into the ether. Um, so I do, um, for example, reviews. So I'm a critic for Glasgow Review of Books. It goes out 
and then it exists there but there's no direct kind of link to me um and there are other bits and pieces that I might submit to I'll pitch bits and bobs to um to magazines like mother lore for example um or um other online journals and then you know it's kind of gone but I felt like Substack could offer me a place where um the archive would be like it would it would live basically and I saw it very much as a place for writing and a place initially really for me just to kind of um drill into like a practice so working on my own stuff um I had no idea that it was going to become this massive kind of community that I was going to basically want to live in Substack because of who I was meeting and the the people that I started to connect with and you were one of the very very first publications that I came across and I can't say how but it was in those early days before notes so I don't really know how we all found each other I've got no idea how did we do it um but you were one of the very first people that I came across and so it became clear that you were building community and that sense of sort of togetherness even before we had all these sort of uh, you know ways to get in touch with each other and reach each other individually um, and that was just so inspiring and lovely and all of a sudden I felt like a world kind of opened up and it became about people so it was less just about me punting some words out it became about having conversations and about being able to kind of um yeah riff off each other as well so not just like I publish a thing and then somebody comments and I comment back but that we were operating within a sort of ecosystem where there was that sort of reciprocity but also like inspiration um and that came you know as a bit of a shock to me actually it wasn't what I expected at all um mm. Yeah, so that was how it all began. That was how it all started. Yeah, it's so lovely to track back to your journey because equally, yeah, I'm not really sure how we found each other. And at that point, I was like, there are so many people, there are so many people. And I wanted to try and forge this deeper connection. And I was really struggling to keep up with reading and I was really struggling to keep up with comments. It was just, it felt like the internet was brand new because of the wave of people that were coming into the publication space that I had at the time, like you said, pre-notes. And then obviously post notes, we've got a different ecosystem as a different way of being able to share our work and our words. So there was something about that web of connection at that time that just felt like, oh, wow, this is like someone walking through my back door and into my kitchen and I'm making them a cup of tea and I'm learning about their life and they're connected to what I'm talking about over in my kind of Substack hub, I guess. Yeah, it was really beautiful. I think that within the co-creation space this is one of the things I talk about a lot actually in client work but also in the membership around the fact that even if somebody leaves a comment it's not really a comment it's the start of a conversation they want to respond to something you've put out and feel compelled to respond and then that is the invitation to talk with them so like the kitchen table analogy and the cup of tea and I feel you do that so well and the topics that you tackle like sometimes I'm just like I just want to read what everybody else has got to say as well as Lindsay's like sophisticated and brilliant work and I don't feel I've got anything to add and that for me is such amazing community as well you know there are all these different layers of co-creation and community and feeling part of something over in your publication you've cultivated it so well and I do think it's testament to your space holding as well because it's not an easy job to be a space holder you know you can be a brilliant writer but being a space holder is separate to that right yeah yeah and and you understand that you know it's it's that kind of if you decide that's what your sub stack is and again it comes back to what you choose so we've maybe made quite similar choices in that that I choose to um to facilitate and to teach using Substack as my sort of um you know that's the place where I host things that happen on Zoom but that this is the space where it all takes place and that leads you down that road far I think more naturally than than maybe just engaging in the written word because you you're, you're this tangible human all of a sudden and so are the people who are coming into your sessions so you see them you know you get to know them I just feel like I've made some you know really significant um friendships with people who maybe initially we were just sort of seeing one another's publications but 
it it changes in a way that you know what you talk about depth of connection all the time that's really what i love and if i think about my other work so i work for a literacy charity um and that's my part-time job this is my, this feels like my full-time job and that one feels like my part-time job um but my actual employment that's that's how i operate so i run training and i run um and i develop courses and i facilitate um across the country either online or in person somewhere and it's all about just finding a way to to connect with an individual or a group but you know one-to-one -one actually because it's about trying to kind of like get everyone's buy-in what is it that's going to help me in this moment to connect with this human in front of me to get the best out of them and for them to get the best out of the day that we have because you know i train people and it's a one day thing and then it's like okay we've shared this wonderful experience together and now you're going to go off out into the world and do your good work and i'm here but you don't need me anymore bye bye but they have to get that they have to get what they need out of that experience so you know and before all of this um in a former former life um i facilitated a women's group so i ran it was called garnet hill um collective and we were um you know, about trying to create that that sense of community and space within a city that maybe if you lived, say you were a different generation to us um, and you were living more rurally, you might be a member of a women's institute, that sort of thing. We were trying to recreate that in a city for younger women. And then before that, I was an English teacher in a high school for 10 years. And so, again, it's my sort of professional life has sort of evolved. There's the writing, but it's about people. And it's about being with people. And I get such energy from that as much as I think, like, you know, people who come along to what, you know, what I do, what you do, you know, it's 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 a feedback loop. Um, but I'm a people person. I yes. like to be with people. Yes. So, and and there's, yeah. there's, the, there's a part of us that just thrives. You know, there's that part that is looking for inspiration. There's that part that is looking for connection that is beyond that kind of vulnerability space of putting our words out into the world it's like if we get that tiny bit of feedback loop like you say it's like oh people want more of this like this is connecting this feels really good like we're in a moment together we're sharing something that feels very very real and you know we're in a mental health epidemic in the UK probably across the world and it's actually caused by loneliness which is bonkers because we've got more connection than we've ever had and I think this is one of the reasons why I got so passionate about depth of connection really early on on Substack because I felt those things on the internet and they're not pleasant and they don't help us to do our best work. And I was like, what if we flip the script? What if we focus on depth of connection as the growth metric? Like that is literally it for me. So you know, when we hold people in a way, and of course people will come and go and that's up to them and that's all good. But everything that I put out is about holding people if just for five minutes in writing a post, although some of my posts are a bit longer than that, or in a group space. And it's that we're all together here and now in this space. How can we, what can we do with that? Like, what does that feel like? And how can that energize us? If we circle back to the memoir part of things, Lindsay, because I've watched this play out and it's been fascinating. I love listening to your memoir. I feel like there is such depth of healing for me. There is such connection. There is such admiration for this beautiful work that you're able to put out in the world. And there's something different about experiencing a memoir in this way that I've never, I don't listen to audio books. Like literally I've never listened to, to one. So my son's listened to Harry Potter at the moment on audio. My mom listens to audio books on a walk. I listen to podcasts. That's what I listen to. I read books. So we've all got this different consumption habit, but with yours, I'm like, oh, okay, like it's bite size. I'm going to go in and I'm going to be held in this space, in this story with somebody that I know in real life. It's, it's just so special to me. Where did the idea come from? How has it been going? How many chapters have you got left to put out in the world? Tell me everything. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll take you back. Um, the, the book went on submission. Um actually quite a number of months ago and it hasn't sold it hasn't sold and I'm going to say it hasn't sold yet but it hasn't sold memoirs really really difficult at the moment and it's it's a hard sell in a way that if I had had it 
ready to go maybe six months or nine months before before it went on submission things may have been a bit different but the the decision was with me and my agent was that we would do audio and I went and recorded the first sort of um three or four chapters of the book initially went into a studio and recorded it and we then used that as part of the submissions package because I decided I wanted to take it back off the shelf the proverbial shelf doesn't really exist out of people's inboxes um, and revamp the submission with audio because I think that it's a strength of mine and it's a thing that's happening within publishing now it's that sort of voice led um, what does you know who, who are you what is your voice is it distinct not just your kind of written word but can you can you deliver on that level because people engage with story in so many different ways and obviously if you do get a deal you're going to do your audiobook you're going to want to do your own if it's a memoir and I think that adds that particular element so then I thought well actually I could use that audio for my members on Substack now this within the sort of publishing industry is brand new so this is not something that certainly in the UK that there's a huge amount of sort of um, certainly no regulation around it. But in terms of convention, what is and isn't acceptable? You know, when it comes to articles, we might post something on Substack um, in written form. And then we couldn't pitch that to a magazine or to a newspaper or a journal. But with books, it's a bit different. So for me to say I'm going to do this as audio felt quite important because it wasn't me sort of putting out chapters, written words. It was about engaging with people who were listening in a different sort of way. Um, so I decided I was going to do that. And I said initially I was going to run it as a sort of limited series. And I did that between um, the start of November 23 and basically the beginning of 2024, about nine episodes. And the way that I'd chosen to do it was that it ran sort of roughly in terms of the calendars all matching up. So that the calendar of the story, the calendar of the memoir, which opened at the end of November uh, 2019, we tracked that same period of time through to sort of Christmas, New Year time. Um, and that was happening in real life, the way that I was sort of uploading those episodes. Um, and then spoke to my agent about it. And I was saying actually how successful it had been. And he was like, OK, we've got some other ideas and I'm working on a proposal right now. And um, he was like, listen, just go for it. This is this feels aligned with, you know, what you want to do. And also where memoirs quite sort of buoyant at the moment, particularly for writers like me. You know, I came to that book, came to write that book um, as a nobody. Like, not somebody with a platform, not somebody with, um, you know, I used to write for, um, so in Scotland, you know, the Herald, the newspaper. I wrote for the Herald. I wrote for um, BBC. I used to do the bite size content for um, the different qualifications that we have here in Scotland. Um, but very much content driven written, uh, writing. It wasn't expressive creative writing. So I didn't have a name. I was also a voice. So I used to, and still do bits, but not quite as much on radio and TV here in Scotland. So I'm like the every mum. Um, what can you say about the fact that exams may be scrapped? Right, I'll tell you about that. What about taking your children to yoga? Yeah, I'll talk about that. So I'd be getting drafted in to do these sorts of things. And it felt like my voice, my personality are suited across that sort of set of media. So I'm, you know, I'm happy doing this. I'm happy speaking. I'm happy with my voice being out in the world. So it all felt like it made perfect sense. And so the feeling is and was that we would just go for it. Steam on, put the whole book out on Substack behind the paywall. Um, and that this book will probably become, if it goes to print publication, book two, rather than book one. Book one is looking like it might be a different thing, which is fine. I'm totally fine with that. Um, but what maybe you will have noticed about those episodes that self-contained sort of thing has led me to to in a way reassess that manuscript and think about how best and I've moved things around because it made better sense for the audio you know for for the cadence of those episodes and that not every episode's the same length 
Sometimes they're pretty short. Sometimes they're about 23 minutes. I haven't got any any longer than that, but some quite short, maybe around about the six or seven minute. And um, also that I can put in all of this stuff that there's absolutely no way I could put into a bound book. All the, the, the material, the family lore, everything that I've got in that electric blanket box in my living room, you know, I can put as much of it as I want into those posts. So we've got the audio, but also these beautiful photos and that, that it brings it to life in a completely different way. It feels far more me in some ways than this. It's all there. So that was that was the thinking. That's And that's where we're at. So now I'm kind of, I'm almost, I'm just a few weeks ahead of everybody who's listening. And people are listening at different stages, which I also love. I get notifications. It'll be like, so-and-so listened to episode 16 or so-and-so listened to the prologue. And you don't get that with a book. Mm. I don't know what chapter people are on, you know, mm -hmm. if they're picking up a print book, but I know exactly where people are because they're hitting the like. And I'm like, that's lovely. Or they're putting a wee comment. And that's really valuable to me. I love it. So, it's so exciting to hear about this, Lindsay. Like, I, 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 it is honestly blowing my mind. Like, I feel mind blown. I feel mind blown that you, in your artistic practice, in your writerly practice, are almost live editing because of the feedback and because of the way of people consuming it and you revisiting it in the same timeline I think that is fascinating as a creative process in itself and then also this confidence around we're going to do it it's new it's bold but we're going to do it this is what we're doing because everybody knows and we've talked about this on the podcast before the timeline for book submissions proposals things being out with agents, it, it can get really, really disheartening. And this here and now is you curating and growing an online platform at well, and also, you know, building a newsletter subscription business or however you want, whatever your creative hub business behind the paywall. And then also this beautiful gift of creating and putting out creative content. And the, in this way that is very special, because of the way people are coming to it and you know we always say and this is this is something I learned from Beth Kempton you know people find things at the right time for them and I think there's something really beautiful about Substack in that things don't get buried in the archives if we if you if we curate them properly if we're saying okay this is this but then circle back to this or come and find us over here and you and I I know both do that absolutely fascinating and so within your week you know your working week it's really full it's really busy but you're also holding pockets of space for lots of different things going on like do you ever feel tired do you ever think wow this, I've set this up to be like a big thing and it's all on fire at once or do you always just feel like this is what I'm here to do this is feeling great and congruent how's it all feel I feel really good about my work and I feel that I own it and that's super important to me that every strand so I feel as though everything that I'm that I'm doing all sort of knits together quite nicely that it, that these different strands belong together and that it's up to me so in my previous kind of freelance life it would be someone else's decision about whether or not I taught a course on Wednesday night for 10 weeks it wasn't my choice I was happy you know I'd take that work that's great but if you know in this case I can say Right, I've, I'm going to have capacity to run a four-week course in May. Then I'm not teaching until September. And then I'm going to run this in September. And then I'm taking a bit of time away. You know, so that works for me because th there's there's an energy sort of, um, you know, consideration that we all have to sort of be aware of. Um, there are certain things that I know are non-negotiable to me. So I know that I will put out words on a Sunday, like that happens. And that feels like it's really important to maintain and that they're mostly free. And the reason that I do that is because I think for me personally, I don't like to fall off a wagon because I struggle to get back on. And I'm not saying that in a way that makes it sound pressurised, but just that if I know that that is something that I am working towards, then my week just has a sense of structure to it. So I know what happens on different days. Um, when the memoir comes to its end, so 
I'll put out episode 22 on Wednesday. Um, we're about two thirds of the way into the story at this point. So we're kind of August, September 2020 at the moment in the timeline of the the year that that memoir sort of um, shows of my life. And we go up to Christmas 2020. So we've got autumn and winter to come. Um, and when that ends, I'm really excited to think about what will drop into that particular slot. Um, and I don't know yet, which actually feels quite exciting. I'm not worried because I feel that um, it's one strand. So for me, it's quite important that, you know, my portfolio of various things that happen on Substack it's not just all eggs in one basket. It's not just here's I do this memoir, but that there's there are all these different bits, and I haven't yet had the horror of thinking I don't know what's next. I've sort of just been riding the wave, and we know how it can be. Particularly, take a summer for example. We had this chat last summer. You sort of go, where is everyone? Where are we all gone? Oh, oh goodness, oh dear. You keep doing what you do. People come back, the, the, things change all the time. But I feel really quite like you're asking, you know, if I feel overwhelmed or busy or whatever, but I just feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. That's really the answer. I'm, I'm, I feel very centered and aligned and regulated, which is the main mm. thing. I don't feel like I'm being sort of put under pressure because it's from me. You know, nobody else, if I don't post on Sunday, no one's going to cry into their cornflakes. But I really enjoy the fact that I've got that, you know, that's happening and out it goes. Yeah. And there's something in this. If you're brand new to Substack and you're listening, you'll be like, what on earth of a portal are these women talking about? But honestly, this is where when you spend time both with your own creative practice and with a community and on a platform that helps to support you, things, there's an evolution to that. Things shift and change and you have creative ideas and you play with things and you test things and you lean into things. And that's basically what I've seen you do and, and is at the heart of my creative practice as well. I know that you have the two paid tiers switched on, Lindsay. So a lot of questions, once people kind of get to grips with Substack and if they decide to offer a membership or a paywalled set of resources or content, they then kind of get in this place where they feel quite stuck around, well, there's a paywall and there's uh, there's articles or whatever I could put behind that paywall, but then there's this other tier. Could you spend a bit of time telling us about what the other tier means for you and how you hold people in that tier and whether you feel there's been a journey for those people, you know, as they were engaging in your audio episodes or reading your words and then they kind of made that decision mm. to jump in. I'd love to know more about that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I obviously do as you do. I, I've got paid, very much turned on, you can be a monthly person. You can be an annual person, which I absolutely love. It's nothing better, actually, than just seeing that somebody has decided to stick with you for a year. It's just so beautiful. And <laughs> oh, thank you. And then I offer most of everything exactly the same for those two groups of subscribers. Access to my courses, live or replays, um, access to the memoir and the archive and the occasional bit of writing that I decide is paywalled straight away. Um, and my archive kicks in after eight weeks. And every now and again, I might like drop a little thing. You know, I'm doing it this Sunday. In fact, I've taken the paywall from something because I was interviewed for The Guardian the other day um, about this particular article that had brought somebody to me because of something I wrote on Substack, which was incredible. So again, it's that thing about how the, the, the archive never dies. So I'm linking to that piece because it feels topical. Um, the difference is that I use founding member as a as a way to differentiate between um everything that I that I offer um for members who pay either monthly or annually um and my memoir teaching. So people who upgrade to founding member um it's by invitation at the moment actually because i really need to limit how many people i take on to those courses 
So twice a year at the moment, March and September, and it'll be the same in 2025. Twice a year, I'm running a course called Memoir in a Month, which is a five week live course, two hours teaching every week um, for a cohort of eight writers. And they can be at any stage in their writing journey when it comes to memoir. They might just be memoir curious. They might be working on something sort of bigger. Um, and as well as the five weeks, we have a guest reader. So last time we had Lily Dunn, which was absolutely amazing to have her. Uh, she wrote Sins of My Father, 2022 Guardian Book of the Year. Um, and she came to speak about ethics in memoir. And next time round, it's Ali Miller, who uh, wrote The Last Days, which also came out in 2022. And both of them write on Substack which I felt was important to me to be able to sort of have that, you know, connection with other writers who are similarly working within that field that I am. Um, and they get a one-to-one -one with me as well, where we can talk about their project um, in a bit more detail. So we have an hour together uh, at some point in the course of our month. Um, and we have a Google Classroom. So we're together in that space as well. So something that can't happen just within, and it could now because all of a sudden, we can limit our messages and our chats to founding members or to members, which is lovely because then I could now use that chat space that I couldn't even use in, in, in March um, to be able just to have those little kind of, you know, dropping some course notes in or a little link to this or let's have a chat. So we were in Google Classroom for the last round um, and we, that space then, so obviously they're welcome to upgrade into that when, their place is confirmed on the course. Um, and then they're with me for the year. Because as a founding member, they get access to that course, but they've also got a year's annual membership where they've got access to everything else as well. And what's been so lovely is that I have made really quite profound connections with people um, across the globe. Brilliant people, brilliant writers, brilliant minds, um, because that has given that course has given me the opportunity to be really really kind of closely involved with them and their work um and you know leads me down different paths makes me think differently so it's not just about output it's about that again i've said it before reciprocity it's about that um sense of community and that we could create that lovely little bubble for five weeks um and i know they're all connected too you know they've they've kind of been able to, to have little you know interactions and things separate from the course um, but that's how I'm using founding member just now and I find that that works for me um, and at the moment my price until the end of 2024 is 150 pounds for that um, and it will not be 150 pounds in 2025 but mm -hmm. it feels that right now that as as a test case, because I've run this course in person before, but never online, that felt aligned for me. Mm. Um, and that's how I'm using it. And it's great. So I love happy. that. And I love what you say about aligned pricing and holding space for that small group as well, because we all know if we've been part of something in a small group, because there are so many opportunities, aren't there, to be part of things online, lots of things all the time, you know, frenzied things all the time. It's like, no, like give us some space, give us some time, give us some depth of connection. And again, it comes back to that. It's holding people in that way. I know when I was interviewed for Russell Nolte's publication, you know, there was this real curiosity over how I had so much support without having another online platform or a bestseller or anything like that. And I was like, I just really built connection. And then people were really supportive. That's literally the black and white of it. That's all it is. I didn't do it as a strategy. I didn't do it you know, purposefully, it's just this is my this is my practice. And this is something I'm really proud to be very rooted in. And I think you're really similar, you're just genuinely passionate about it. I think it's really nice to hear how you are holding space within that founding member tier, because I know people are curious about it. And people are trying to sort of find the right fit. Substack has evolved. Obviously, it was just give give me a bit more money, and you can be a founding member. And won't that feel nice, you know, so to be able to go, actually, we've carved out something different with that space. And I did a little bit of a test in December. And I learned so much because I was trying to do too much with that space at the moment you can't have a payment plan with founding members but I wanted to offer that to my community because it's part of the values of my business and then it ended up just being a whole load of extra admin 
So I was like, no, actually, okay, founding members, this is what it is. And I'm going to offer all the value that I can in that space for those people. So the way that I've got around it, and I just think people will be interested in this. Yes, there is the founding member chat now, although there are a few technical hiccups with it. So just <laughs> go steady, guys. Um, but I also say now that Substack has DMs, if anybody has anything that they want to ask me about tech stuff or strategy, my DMs are open to that tier only. So I call them my diamond members. And it just feels like such a space holder to be able to say, here we all are on Substack. You're stuck with something. You don't have to go and search for an article or watch a video. You can literally just ask. So that's felt like the next level for me to like unpack what that connection is. And similar to you, obviously, there are at the moment, you know, a handful of people that I feel very, very connected to and that I chat with most weeks. And then it feels like, yeah, such a joy to be able to hold space for their creative development. And for some of them, it's not about running a new a business newsletter that's going to impact them in terms of financially it's actually about a creative outlet that is going to impact on their well-being so there's those two things that we hold as creative practitioners and we know that you know we know that yes sometimes there is an opportunity to earn money and to monetize what it is that we're doing and to build success in that way but on the other side of the coin there's this space where it might be quieter, but there's so much fulfillment in just being able to understand what our unique creative practice is outside of capitalism, outside of growth, outside of any of those things that we might be seeing or getting tangled up in. So, yeah, beautiful. So so the memoir classes and then we've got the paid space um, the audio recording and the writing. Obviously, Lindsay is a fantastic writer. Please go and read our words if she's new to you. But I wanted to ask a little bit about the tech side, Lindsay. So we've talked about this on the Sparkle call before. And obviously, I've got over a whole load of barriers. Like I did not, I was not comfortable with my voice when I first decided to start trying to use it online. It was a different thing. How can we get ourselves comfortable in the tech side and kind of remove some of those barriers to mm. being able to even just read our posts? Like, let's just take a really simple, we're going to read our posts as just an extra for our subscribers. How would we do that? What do we need? Well, I think things have gotten a bit easier all of a sudden. And I'm really curious to give that a go because I, when I first started wanting to offer voiceover of written posts just in terms of accessibility, I wasn't really very enamored with the quality of the voiceover option just within Substack. But I'm seeing, I think even just this week, someone said it, and maybe it was you also, that it's had a bit of a revamp. Something's a bit different. So that for me felt like a massive hurdle because I've got my, you know, I've got my own, like I've got other microphones and things, but nothing, I had to go outside of Substack in order to create the audio of a quality that I felt was listenable. And that's not even taken into account the fact that, you know, you've got to get over speaking, using your own voice, being confident in your voice. You know, that's another thing altogether. So this is really about the tech. Um, I use a different um, program for my audio. So I've got a decent mic. I'm just today on my computer. I'm, I don't have my decent mic with me in this today. But when I'm recording and I know it's like a kind of, you know, for the memoir, for example, or a, a voiceover of a post now, then I'm in my little booth in my office and I've got my decent mic, the pop shield. And then I run that audio um, into a program called Podcastle AI. Some people actually, it was on Substack that somebody had recommended that I use this. And so the audio goes into that and then it gets a little kind of like bit of magic dust all over it, makes it all nice, takes out all the whatevers. Um, and it sounds, I think, you know, passable. <laughs> Rich enough. It's not the same as being in a studio, of course, um, but I'm happy with it. And then I take it, I just take it out of that. So it's called Podcastle, Podcastle AI. I'll pop it in the, the chat. Um, and I just, yeah, take, it's really intuitive. And then you can actually add in things like um, royalty-free um, bits of audio, you know, audio or um, sound, um, music or sound effects. You can drop in your own stuff. Um, and then I just take it, download it, and then 
just fire it straight in. And then I do the same. I always put a preview um, as well for um, my free subscribers so that when I'm putting out a paywalled audio episode of something, it still goes to everybody. I don't want it only to go to my sort of 140 plus paid people. I want to make sure that it's still dropping in the inbox of all the other people who are in my community because it might be the thing that makes them think, oh, I really want more of that. So I always give like a sort of two minute preview as well. And all that means is I just go back into my podcast or bit, take out the bit that I want to use as my preview and then drop that into the into the post as well. And it's really quite easy to do. Um, and then you can decide, you can decide whether you want the transcript on or the transcript off. Um, you get to decide what you'd like your background image to be for that piece of audio. Um, and 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 then obviously you've got underneath that, you know, the same capabilities of any other post on Substack where you can put in your odd, you know, your video, your pictures, your text. Um, and so that's sort of how it works for me. But I am curious. So I want to try uh, for this weekend's post actually, just to do the audio directly in to, to Substack and just see what's changed um, as a wee experiment because it's always evolving. Um, and I think that, you know, that every week now, we just feel like there's something else that is um, is coming up for, uh, you know, something to try. Oh, it's thing. a treat. It's like literally living yeah. in the Substack sweet shop. You're like, oh, I was just getting used to this and now they've dropped this and it's sort of... So when I was doing my voice notes, so I started on Creatively Conscious, which is my wholehearted business newsletter that I send. And I started just recording directly into Substack and recording for 11 minutes. Those were my parameters. I was just like, I'm just going to talk. Um, I think I called it My Beautiful Reality and then the name of the month, whatever month it was. And I did it for however long, eight months or something. And I just talked for 11 minutes to Substack and then pressed, yeah, okay, that's it. And then I would put it out. And then they would say, is this a podcast? And I was like, well, not really. No, it's just a voice note update. So that went in and that was one of the big things that brought me lots of new subscribers, lots of people listening in the background and understanding that I was here in the northeast of England. They were in Australia or America or Canada or wherever they were. And it brought depth of connection straight away. It took 11 minutes of my time plus two minutes to upload it and write, here's another one. <laughs> it was so fast. And it was just to do with the time that I had because I had very little childcare. And that space of experimenting with not only the platform, but also my creative practice and dropping that perfectionist mask that I've always had to use in the corporate and charity sector. You know, it was like, I don't have to do that. This is my space. I get to just show up. It can be messy. Whatever happens is fine. And that was really, really nice to do. And again, I didn't use a professional mic. We do have a Blue Yeti. So again, I'll put these comments in, but this is what a Blue Yeti looks like. We've had this for years. I use this for audio um recording so I did a lot of oral histories on a project and it was gorgeous for that the sound quality is amazing but even with these podcasts you know I just use my Apple plug-in mic and headphones and that is totally fine I have got a brand new laptop it's less than a year old I've also got these soundproof boards from Ikea so I'll spin you around if you're watching on video this is what they look like so they're just like a carpeted board so I've got a couple of them and I'll probably get a couple more because I really like being in this little cocoon and it does affect the sound quality but I would say when you first start it is more about people hearing your voice than it is professionally produced audio content and obviously if you're a memoirist and you're leaning into this curiosity of serializing or you, you want to know about that space, then obviously you can grow into that space and you can think about it. But I would say don't think about it for too long because it'll just stop you doing things. Substack are telling us that growth is two times as fast if we use audio in our publications. And I've gone from seeing hardly anyone using it to lots more people using it. You know, people want to give it a go. They want to experiment. They want to get over those blocks. And I think if you are nervous about using it, all you've got to do is listen to somebody else and realize it's not that easy, but it's also not that hard. You know, you just do it and then you go, wow, like I've done a new thing. I've learned it. I'll give it a go. So I do think that we don't have to let it be a barrier. I think if we're curious and we want to try it, there are lots of ways with it. Um, and I think it is about stepping into that space of trying it. And the easiest thing to do is to read a post. So yeah would you say Lindsay that's good advice for folks wanting to try it out yeah absolutely and the other thing that that I've 
played around with is that with that audio, instead of just reading the post, um, to, I would play around with just chatting directly, unscripted, to those people who might be listening. And if, if that's paywalled, then that's different to the written content, just being like, you know, far more informal about it. Um, because you can like riff on it a bit, can't yeah, you? Yeah, and unpack people it like a bit. That. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and just and and what I actually love in audio is that you know I do the direct you know accessibility read along with the post, but I love when other creators step out of that and give you more of themselves in that audio than you might get if you're just reading the post. And the fact that you can listen along, you know, that I was so delighted with the app when all of a sudden we had this audio or media option to see and filter for when people were were giving you that as a as as an option um, and I know also so my brother he's like my um he's he's the sense test every single week he'll be like um send me a whatsapp your episode <laughs> had a bit of dead ear at the end or he'll say, and he's not listening in Substack, so I've made sure that it's 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 listenable outside of Substack. So you know, if you go into your settings, you pick um, that it's that it, it can be uh, listened uh, to in another player. So he's listening to it, whatever it is that he's listening as a paid member, um, so that he's he's getting the somehow. And don't ask me how this bit works because I don't know, but he can listen. Um, and when he when he changed, he changed his subscription at one point because I was putting him on a coupon and he was like, I can't get this episode. And he had to just like uninstall his thing and reinstall it. And then he was he was back in the zone. So it does work. And I wasn't sure how that would work. You know, if someone's listening on Spotify or they're listening in Apple or whatever, they're somehow they're getting the 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 audio that they have paid for in Substack. They're not getting you know, everything when they're only a free subscriber, um, you know, which was important to me as well, that sense of accessibility. Yeah, have it all if you've paid, you know, if you're within that membership, but that maybe Substack isn't the place that you're doing that listening. Maybe it's somewhere else. And I know that you've done this too, where it's it's possible to listen in different places. Um, so I suppose it's, it's, it's seeing Substack as the place where things begin but that they might have a life outside of that for people who um are engaging in in different ways but i just think it's it's lovely and i just i love to hear people's voices yeah. um you know thinking yeah. about something like laura oldfield sound circle when we were doing those little um snippets you know it doesn't have to be a massive thing it might just be that your that your audio so i've done things before and i know that you know we'll, we'll you know be moving on to questions just shortly but um where I've dropped in almost like what you've said, that little audio diary type mm. thing at the start of a post that's not a voiceover. It's a different thing, but it's within the the sort of scope of that particular post. I did it, you know, for a thing that I'd done when I was on a writing retreat in December. And I thought, I'm going to put this little voice note up, but then I'm going to put in the thing that I wrote um, earlier that day just to see what, what was different, you know, what had happened to me in the course of a day from yeah. in between a voice note and a diary entry so we've got so many options we've got Mm. loads of different ways to play with it and I think it's just down to the individual to think about what it means for them within their is. I think that you know that mind map and trying to work out what feels good you know what you're talking about is the RSS feed which you know it is magic behind the scenes yeah it's magic so the majority of people that listen to Sparkle on Substack listen in Apple podcasts but it was because I couldn't get it to pull through to Spotify it would never work for me um and it was one of those things that was on my to-do list that I never quite got round to that I should have. And then all of a sudden, Substack made that seamless and easy. I pressed a button. Somebody messaged me, became a paid subscriber because they'd found me on Spotify. So there we go. You know, magic just like that. But yeah, we do have the option to audio read our posts. We've got the option to podcast. We've got the option to have audio and decide later whether we want to pull it through to other podcast platforms. There's all sorts of options. But I I see it as a completely separate section within Substack on both of my publications and I think being able to see okay what does the podcast hold space for or what does the audio hold space for is maybe the first question you ask yourself because if the answer is 
for my subscribers to feel a deeper sense of connection and understanding of my work and who I am in the world, that's great. But it doesn't have to just be that. There's so many ways with it. Well, let's go to questions because I don't want to um, run over and keep Lindsay too long. And I know we've got some. So if anybody wants to jump on live, you're super welcome. Otherwise, I will read one out and that's totally fine. And then we'll stop recording after the first one and we'll have a little chat all together. Um, so I'm going to read. OK, so that yeah, that's Emma's question. We've answered that one. That was about housing it. Um, so Emma's saying, would you recommend voice recording all Substack articles? I wonder whether to go back and voice record old ones. What would you say to that, Lindsay? What's your thoughts? Mm, I saw that come in, Emma. And I think um, it could be a nice thing to do if you then are linking back to those posts in your new posts. I'm just imagining how... You know, like if someone's gonna, if someone's gonna come across that, maybe it's a nice thing for you to lead them to it, um, and just remind them of what what there is, rather than go to. I'm mean, I'm just thinking about this in terms of my own capacity. Like if I was to to go back and put audio on posts that don't currently have audio, um, I wouldn't know whether or not that was gonna be or have been worth my while, um, whether or not someone was going to go and just spot that there was audio there, I think I'd want to try and find a way to make it, like, make it a thing, find a way to to make sure people knew now that it was that it was there and that they could do that. Um, and I think that thing even just about reminding people of what we have already done, you know, we're so, and it's a, a bit more about just content, you know, we generate so much content and I wish I could take my own advice on this sometimes, um, you know, to remind people that there is an archive, to remind them of what we wrote last week or the week before or three months ago um, and do this within our posts because then, you know, they're, they're likely hopefully to click back through and find something of value. Because I don't know what you guys think, but I, you know, subscribe to somebody and I'm with them in real time. I don't often go back um, unless there's a reason for it and so if you're saying about audio then that's a reason to go back and be like I'm going to listen to Emma I'm going to I haven't read that one yet so I'm going to make a point of um, of of going and listening uh, yeah I agree and I think there's something really special about leaning into a post that particularly resonated with people so for International Women's Day when I did the big collaboration with lots of female writers on Substack there was a piece of audio that went in the invitation and it was only time that I didn't read the whole post and like really extend that almost like audio letter to everybody but it's something that I would love to do next year if we do something similar but I think if you've had a post particularly resonate with people it's really worth bringing that audio to that putting it in your welcome email so linking it in your welcome email even your about page if it's been like a one that particularly represents who you are on Substack but also then reminding people like Lindsay says oh well, actually I just went back and recorded audio with this and um, you might be new to my work you might like to listen or it, you know it's listenable to now or whatever the correct phrase would be around that I think there's so there's so much playful scope with that stuff and I think also when we record and I've done this when I've done the read aloud function even on just a word document and you hear it read you're like oh I can see that in this part I want to go deeper or in this part that's maybe more information and I'm not a skilled memoir writer at all but I hope to be one day I'm on my journey um, and a good friend of mine and a friend of Lindsay's as well Caro talked about us leaving ghosts on the page and there's something really fascinating to me about being able to express ourselves through the written word and then in reading it, know in our bodies what, what we're comfortable with. So do we want to extend more of that into the ether? Do we want to pull back a little bit? So there's something in that creative process that I am just really geeky and fascinated with. So there could be something there for you as well. Mm -hmm. um, Lindsay, what, what is the name of your Substack? How do people find you on Substack? What do they type in to get it? They type in what now with Lindsay Johnston there we go. that's it that's, that's it. There it. You go. and they'll see yeah, your lovely hair your lovely face see, in the middle and the hair. see all this I'm 99% here these days <laughs> <laughs> you can ask Lindsay about her hair it's epic every time I see her I'm like 
that hair is amazing. I just love it. I just love oh. it. What do you, how, I mean, how, we'll not do this now, but I'm going to ask Lindsay about her hair. I'm going to voice note her on Instagram about her hair and get her to give me some tips. Um, okay, so <laughs> I'm going to stop the podcast recording and we're going to stay online for a little bit to chat to our paid members and to go into more of a workshop style audio lesson if anybody needs that but it's been so beautiful thank you so so much Lindsay it's been amazing fascinating to hear from you such a treat thank you so much lovely way to spend a Friday afternoon I'll see you soon